Good afternoon, uh, everyone uh, on the call. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome you all to a joint BITE and Eurasia uh, webinar today that will delve into the EU industry outlook. Uh, and to give you uh, the insights uh, and discuss the critical factors shaping the future of a European industry, we have Henning Leustein from Eurasia Group and Har Harry Oeman from BITE. Uh, Henning Glöstein is the dir uh, Director of Energy, Climate and Resources at Eura Eurasia Group. Um, he covers geopolitical risk in oil and natural gas markets, as well as the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Um, and before joining Eurasia Group in 2019, he uh, was with Reuters, uh, both when in Asia as the Asia Energy Editor, and before that he led the uh, Reuters um, uh, power, gas and coal coverage from, from London. Um, Harry Oeman is our senior EU ETS analyst at Veit. His main focus is on the carbonization of the industry sector. And prior to joining Veit, he was working in McKinsey and Vivid Economics. Uh, first, we will have um, Henning uh, provide uh, an overview of industry and energy intensity trends in Europe. Um, and then uh, before kind of Harry uh, will focus on industry's role in the EUTS context and we'll do scenarios on um, more kind of the uh, scenarios that Henning will uh, will paint in his, his presentation. We have a Q&A um, panel, so if you have any questions for uh, for the participants, uh, you can post your question there, and we'll do a Q&A uh, session towards the end of the uh, presentation. Um, but then it's my pleasure to uh, give the floor to Henning. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ingvild. Hi, Harry, and thank you, Veit, for the invitation to participate in this. I'm um, looking forward to the conclusions. This is a bit of a uh, experimental joint venture um, because uh, so uh, we at Eurasia Group we've been tying together the the data that we've got from from clients and from policymakers around Europe, and then we pass that on and that information on to to Veit and Harry, and we'll see what that um, where where that brings us to. I have a few um, slides prepared. It won't be a terribly long um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, so fear not. Um, but um, there's a couple of uh, data points that are probably worth uh, keeping in mind. So uh, the agenda is very briefly, because we came um, uh, into this situation where we're in sort of facing the winter 2023, 2024 through an emergency that was caused initially by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and then the escalatory energy uh, conflict between Russia and the West and in particular Europe. Um, so, uh, we'll have a very quick, but really very brief look at where we are on gas markets here in, in Europe right now, because uh, that will actually give us quite a lot of information on where we're headed, because policymakers have had to interfere in an emergency situation and now are trying to adapt uh, in the more long term. And that is the energy um, and industry policy that is now um, emerging across Europe with some hard examples. And uh, after that, I'll, I'll hand over to Harry to see what that actually means for carbon markets and, um, and prices. Um, so, I mean, it's in, in the very briefest of terms, like we don't really expect any shortages again this winter. You've probably all seen uh, gas inventories across Europe are literally full. And this year's full gas inventories are 10%, is 10% more gas than last year's full gas inventories. Consumption is much lower. Um, so we're probably going to be all right. But the key situation is that in order to get to this, we're probably going to be all right situation, we've had to cut consumption across Europe really heavily. And I mean consumption of residential natural gas or heating, especially of the gas used for power generation and gas, especially used by heavy industry. And that, that's something I'm going to focus on a fair bit. And you can see here on this chart of so the pre-war situation in Europe, so pre-February 2020, lots of nice gas. And here we are in 2023, there's very little pipeline gas coming in from Russia. And in order, i.e. there's also less gas available overall, which is an important thing to keep in mind, because yes, we've imported a lot of liquefied natural gas, so LNG, and the Norwegians have sent more via pipeline, and so have the Algerians. 
But overall, there is less gas in the European market than there was one and a half years ago. And we got here by vastly cutting um, energy demand, uh, gas demand across Europe and vastly increasing um, LNG imports. But the demand destruction is even bigger than the LNG import increase. Um, I remember very well when Eurasia Group, in a, in a moment of glory in May 2022, we said that Europe would probably get through the winter um, of last winter without crises because they would uh, destroy about 65 billion cubic meters of gas demand. We were shouted and laughed at in equal measure, but actually it turns out that uh, Europe's gas demand destruction was 82 billion cubic meters. Um, and it's continuing. And this is a, a really important situation to be aware of because what's happening is that policymakers and companies across Europe are trying to uh, uh, switch or uh, convert the emergency situation that we found ourselves in exactly a year ago. This time in 2022, we were all worried about, will we get through this winter? Will there be load shedding? Will there be another price spike? Um, uh, and here we are a year later, and it's like, no, probably no shortage. But in to, to get there, cost an arm and a leg, literally. Well, not literally, but phys and financially, it costs huge sums of money. It costs governments across Europe probably to the order of one trillion euros, which comes two years after spending just as much uh, or even a little bit more on COVID. And um, so the fiscal pressure is enormous. It comes at a vast cost to it. household, cost of living crisis. Companies that have spent hundreds of billions of Europe to cope with this, improving their efficiency and building new supply lines. So here we are. We're halfway through this transition. We're turning from emergency uh, management towards long-term adaptation. And getting the second half done, which is roughly by 2030, which is the, the price horizon we'll be looking at, is going to cost uh, a lot of money. And the way um, we, we work with this with clients and talk to them is what's happening is it requires a lot of front loading of capital expenditure. So CapEx, spending money in order to bring down operational expenditure in future OPEX. Um, and that means, again, it means spending a lot of money to, to adapt, but also because we've already spent so much money, we, I mean, um, households, governments, and companies, you don't want to give those gains back. You don't want to return to the status quo ante because um, we, we've already made so much uh, advancement. So it'd be a bit silly to just, you know, throw it all away and turn back and pretend nothing has happened. So what's what's going on here is the EU and, and its member state are combining COVID-19 measures, which are unspent. So for instance, Italy still has 200 billion euros of unspent COVID measures which the European Commissioner said, the Italy, if you don't spend it, we'll take it back, thank you. Um, and so they're gonna spend it. Um, and this is going into energy support measures for households, for industries, uh, to develop broad industrial policy aimed at regaining competitiveness, because I'm sure you've all heard uh, the ghost of deindustrialization in Europe. Um, so uh, Europe is a major manufacturing hub. It is actually the overall export, most export uh, reliant manufacturing block on earth. Um, and But at the same time, to accelerate the green transition, because there is an important thing to keep in mind here. Politically and economically speaking, if you look at the price explosion and the uh, risk of shortages last year, and the causes of this, it is the, because a major supply, in this case, the biggest supplier of oil, natural gas, and coal to the European Union became hostile and cut supply, and prices erupted. So again, politically and economically speaking, if if your biggest supplier of fossil fuels causes a price eruption because they're unreliable, the signal is to invest into domestic and preferably clean capacity. That is, economically speaking and politically speaking, the most basic message, um, a message here. Now you can, there's uh, other arguments around, but th th this is at the core of these message. And that's why you've got the EU Green Industrial Plan. Of course, it was also a response to the US Inflation Reduction Act when suddenly US turned around and popped up as a major competitor in the green industry, so there was a, a need to act. But a, a, a crucial component here is to combine these EU level measures with national programs. So we heard last uh, week the German government suddenly reduced industrial um, electricity taxes. It is continuing to give price support to its most energy intensive and export reliant industries. It has import, uh, introduced earlier this year a contract for difference for decarbonizing heavy industry which they um, snazzily call the Klimaschutzvertrag, so climate protection contract. Um, and the, all this combined measure is to incentivize decarbonization and reduce energy import reliance. Um, 
and uh, uh, and to, to to be able to have sufficient energy to continue to invest. We do think at Eurasia Group, this is our core message, um, uh, that this will likely further reduce the EU's overall fossil fuels energy imports, and it will reduce cost pressure further in 2024. Uh, now, energy costs are still too high, but they're nowhere near as high as they were last year. And we think this will continue to decrease next year um, because these incentives are all in place and uh, will probably lead help lead to slightly lower inflation and um, a return of some more normalcy by some point next year. Um, now, important is that these moves are aimed at to reverse it, we, uh, a recent industrial contraction. You can see that at the bottom left of this chart. That's the EU industrial production. It has been in decline um, for most of this year. Now, it's a small consolidation that US industrial output looks just as bad, even if they don't have energy cost problems, but it's still bad. And we do have an energy cost problem, plus other issues. So this thing needs to be uh, coming down. And uh, you can see the bottom right here. Yes, the, the measures that the uh, German government, for instance, has introduced, as including last week, le no, no, mean that the going forward, the industrial electricity price is, is less than half as high as it was um, in 2022, but it's still higher than it was before the start of the war. So it is still a cost pressure. It is still not a comfortable situation and it requires more policy interaction and, and thinking. And uh, in this context, it is quite important uh, that the EU and especially its most energy intensive region, and that is Northwest Europe. And that is basically Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, and France, sort of the North Sea Basin, roughly. Uh, they consume the most energy. They produce the most uh, heavy industrial goods, steel, chemicals, that sort of stuff. Um, and they are having to reevaluate a little bit the industrial nature. That, that's not to be confused with this, this ghost of deindustrialization. What, what we mean by that is uh, they are having to look at how much energy is being spent to produce how much in terms of GDP. Um, and uh, you, you're having a look at uh, the uh, chemical industry before this crisis, you can see that um, chemical and pharmaceutical production contributed roughly 2% to, let's in this case, German GDP, but it caused uh, uh, consumed almost 40% of all of Germany's industrial gas consumption and almost 30% of all of industrial energy consumption overall. Um, now, that was fine when gas was ample and cheap. It is not fine, keep in mind at the start, when gas is less uh, available, there's less gas available in volume, so it's a scarce product, and prices are high for everyone. Then you need to reevaluate a little bit of what your economic makeshift is. Um, and you can see here, um, if, for instance, uh, Germany imports substitutes some base chemical products, as it has been uh, the case, for instance, uh, for ammonia in the fertilizer sector, uh, that frees up huge volumes of gas and, and energy as a whole that can be used making other products preferably value added as in you know that they give you that inject more value into overall gdp than the base chemical products now that is not good if you're a base chemical producer if that's your economic business then then this is uh, uh, an issue but if you take for instance electric vehicles high-tech machines robots optical good, goods digital goods and you can see here, this change is already happening in Germany. And I take Germany because it's the data is available and it's, it's, it's very representative also of what's going on in the Netherlands. You can see overall uh, that manufacturing um, employment in Germany has actually been increasing this year, although there's no overall economic growth um, because consuming is, uh, consumption is, uh, is very weak, retail consumption is weak and so forth. But overall employment has increased because the loss in employment in the base chemical sector has been more than offset in other fact sectors. And this is partly thanks to the, um, to the fact that the chemical sector uses so much energy that by just shutting down or, or mothballing a little bit of that, you are freeing up energy in other areas which consume far less energy and, and add value um, uh, to GDP. And now if this sounds a bit academic, it, it, it really isn't. You can uh, We talk to government officials who, who think about this in great detail and um, and multi conglomerate industrial companies who really think, okay, where do we shift production? Even chemical producers will say, oh, look, we, we we produce hundreds of different chemicals. What if we just take one of them out that uses a lot of energy to make and uh, and make that somewhere else, import it, whatever, and then uh, take that energy, literally, and financial uh, costs just to make something different? And this is a, a thinking that is going on across Europe. 
And this again brings you to price because the key goal is of course still lower power prices. Now, not necessarily gas, it needs power prices. Power price is, is the one that we all pay at the end. I mean, sure, some people buy gas, but most retail consumers, most industrial consumers pay for the energy in terms of electricity and the rest is feedstock. Um, so we need no, lower power prices in Europe, but not necessarily low. Um, so most EU national measures have, have the goal to get you know, out of that hamster wheel, that after every winter, uh, we, we have to restock our gas inventories to ahead of next winter. That drives the price of gas unnaturally high for the low demand season in spring and summer, uh, because there's these government mandates to refill the stocks ahead of next winter, and then we worry whether it gets cold or not. Um, now, the, the only real way to do this is to use less gas. Uh, it, it's th that is the the easy, easiest in parentheses uh, way to do this, um, and it will help bring down wholesale power prices to tolerable level for industry and households. Now, prices already dropped, as I mentioned. You can see on the bottom left here they they way below uh, what they were in mid 2022. But the forward curve for base load electricity is still too expensive. It is still above 100 euros megawatt hour for most of Northwest Europe. And that's still too high. We talk a lot to heavy industry. They they kind of say like, look, we if we could get to a structural price of seventy to eighty euros a megawatt hour, it would be okay. It's not great, but uh, it's still higher than it used to be. But given that we're using less energy now, we're becoming more efficient. We can tolerate that level. So this is an important price corridor we need to be aware of because um, this is where the recent EU energy market reform is 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 going towards. The uh, governments and authorities, they will allow contracts for differences for operators and investors to, to sign up to. So the government uh, pays the operator and investor a contract for difference that structurally falls probably between 60 and 70 euros a megawatt hour for the operator over 10 years. Um, and uh, that allows that operator to then offer power purchase agreements to their industrial customers at about 70 to 80 euros a megawatt hour, which again is that price where most industries say, look, look if we could get there, we, we wouldn't deindustrialize, we wouldn't need to shut down, we could still could produce um, fairly normally again. And this is where the PPAs that, uh, uh, that we've seen over the last couple of weeks that have been announced, they all fall roughly into that price range. And it is also an important price range because if you're an investor, and again, Europe needs more energy sources, keep in mind there's less gas than there was before this crisis. So we need more domestic clean energy capacity. And of course, an investor wants to make money, so it can't be too cheap. And this is why uh, lower power prices are the goal, but not necessarily low power prices. If you're an investor, you're looking at the levelized cost of electricity, famous LCOE, and you say, okay, if we talk a uh, 70, 80 euros a megawatt hour structural price, uh, we can, yes, we can develop virtually all forms of uh, renewable electricity and then add some intermittency and storage solution to it. We can maybe even at some point start developing CCOS, so carbon capture solutions on gas, Nuclear will probably be a bit uh, tricky, but uh, the French say they'll be able to do it. So good on them. But so the investor says we can invest. The consumer says we can consume at that price. And the operator, the utility says, yes, we can operate at that price as well. So that is where we think in the Eurasia Group, the equilibrium will come into. And this is important when we talk, and I'm getting to the end now, uh, about the future of gas uh, consumption, because again, we need to get gas consumption down to enable that. Because if, if gas prices are continuously too high, because every spring and summer we have to mandate our gas inventories to fill them up, price is going to be high. Gas is still an important um, uh, fuel in the power mix. That will this Then this goal will become impossible. And then in terms of policy rules, there's sort of a traffic light uh, rule basket, uh, um, a basket of uh, policy rules to get here. And those are bans. You ban coal-fired power generation. You ban uh, gas boilers from a certain point of view. And, you know, those the regulator says they want to stop you using it, and then fair enough, uh, then it'll happen. Then there are penalties and, and tightening regulation. The carbon market, uh, the, the, the EU um, emissions trading system is one of those. It's a penalty on uh, on carbon use. Uh, Ultra-low emission zone in London is, is, is another of those things. Um, those are things where the regulator or the government doesn't like you doing something, but they can't really forbid it yet because it would be too disruptive to ban it immediately. So they start putting a penalty on something. And then you've got subsidies where the government says, you, um, uh, the, the industry, we will give you a contract for dif uh, difference to decarbonize your system. We'll give your household uh, a cash grant in order to replace your gas boiler with an electric heat pump. You get a subsidy for buying an electric vehicle. These are everywhere. 
And wherever you see all these three uh, policy tools in action at the same time, so banning, future bans, penalties, current and immediate subsidies, things change really fast because companies adjust really fast. Nobody wants to be the last um, uh, car maker selling internal combustion engine. Nobody wants to be the last house on the street having a gas boiler. Nobody wants to be the last chemical maker buying LNG in the market. This, this sort of herd mentality becomes uh, really strong, especially if you actually get money to change. So in Europe, we've seen really strong, uh, this, this combination of policy tools uh, really active in the Northwest uh, Europe basin, as I mentioned, that's where most gas consumption is. Um, and uh, most of these policies are in place and in Iberia, so Spain and Portugal, they're also very strong in this area. And we think uh, this will have a very strong impact on gas demand, which brings you to my last slide before I ha hand over to Harry or any questions is, this is where we think Northwest European gas consumption will go uh, uh, between now and 2030. You can actually see already that current gas consumption, so in the first nine months of 2023, was already far, far lower than it was in the first nine months of 2020, when Europe was in a deep recession and we're all stuck at home being bored or watching Netflix because of COVID. So we are, uh, it's also lower than it was in this time last year when there was the price explosion. It's far lower than it was in 2021 before this crisis. So that tells you that although industrial output has been weak, but Industrial consumption um, output in Europe has not collapsed by 25%. No way. Um, it, it has stagnated. But this already tells you uh, uh, that these, these, um, this traffic light system of policy tools is already in action. There's a corporate drive, household drive to reduce consumption, to become smarter with tools. And this will continue. And so we think there's three scenarios active um, between now and 2030. You've got the more ambitious scenario, which would um, bring Northwest European gas consumption. Northwest Europe consumes about 60% of the EU overall gas uh, uh, way, way down by reducing energy consumption at an industrial and residential level without any significant delays. So no hiccups. Um, we all replace our gas boilers. Heavy industry starts using green hydrogen, uh, uh, battery storage. And every solution that you have goes ahead without significant delays. And there will be significant technological scalability starting from mid 2024, early 2025, as for instance, electrolysis units are deployed at a bigger scale. That is a more ambitious scenario. It is not a base case scenario. Then you have, I'll, start, I'll go to the unambitious scenario. It also sees an ongoing demand reduction in the industrial and residential sector because of present support mechanisms uh, and because of high prices. It's just annoyingly expensive to use energy. However, progress will slow from around 2025 because the energy cost pressure will probably um, reduce by then because there'll be more global gas available, Qatar LNG coming to the market, the US producing more. So the cost pressure eases, people get a bit sick, uh, fed up with being um, uh, too smart and uh, too cautious with energy use. So will companies, and maybe the fiscal pressure. So, you know, high interest rates, high debt, uh, you know, energy policy competes with pension, competes with defense, with healthcare costs, that they'll have to dial back some of the measures. Um, but even in that unambitious scenario, we think green, um, the technological scale of energy solutions becoming better, electrolysis, electrolysis will be better, um, gas uh, um, intensive industries will become much smarter, they already have become much smarter and will continue to do so. So there will be still a significant reduction in gas consumption in Northwest Europe because of ongoing and already implemented trends. That brings us to the base case, base case scenario which is the middle scenario, which is what most analysts always do, but we actually think this is the most accurate one uh, because we will see continued industrial and residential decarbonization because of the policy tools that are already in place and that have just been announced, including for Germany, the Netherlands, the, uh, France, that uh, just came out with another one as well. Um, but there will be no imminent acceleration 2024. So uh, 2024 and 2025 won't be an acceleration in gas demand reduction over this year or last, um, because there, there, there will be some policy snacks. Um, there will be some delays. We're already seeing the offshore wind sector is having trouble. The green hydrogen sector is having some real trouble getting to scale. They'll get there, but maybe not as fast as people think. And there is some fiscal pressure. However, we do think that this trend will continue because, and this is politically quite important, virtually all governments and their main oppositions across the EU and in the UK are broadly in favor of this trend. Uh, in the UK, we think, for instance, Labour will win the next election and that they would be even greener than the current government. 
And yes, Prime Minister Sunak in the UK has dialed back some policy measures, but he has also increased the gas boiler uh, grant for a household. In Spain, Prime Minister Sanchez has just managed to somehow stay in power. In Germany, if the opposition wins, it would be the Christian Democrats, which was Angela Merkel. It's kind of same samey. Uh, Poland has just voted in a new government that will probably be more climate friendly. Uh, France is pretty steady in its policy as well. And in Italy, even far right Meloni has gone ahead with current policies. So we do think this will happen and this will continue. And the technological scalability and the improvement of technology, because technology, it's worth keeping in mind, gets cheaper the more and better the more you use it, unlike fuel, which gets more expensive the more you use it. But technologies are scalable. The more we use EVs and electric heat pumps and uh, electrolysis units, the better they get and the cheaper they get. And we think this will continue. And that is why we um, use this base case scenario for Northwest Europe's gas demand by 2030, which basically means Northwest Europe's gas consumption over um, uh, versus now will probably halve uh, by the end of this decade. With that, I don't know whether there's any questions or Harry, whether you want to directly pile in what that means for power markets. Um, I think I'll, I'll just pile in here straight away. So I'll so take I'll, down my slides. Bear with me. I will just share my. There you go. So, so for Wade's part of this this webinar, we will we will talk more about put, putting putting some of what Henning's talked about a little bit into context of EATS. Uh, and uh, the way we will do this, or the way I've structured this, is that I first of all will do a little summary of, of industry within the EATS to date. So the composition of industry, what are the subsectors, historical trend, what's happening with, with decarbonization, and then look at prices and, 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 and industry productions together and see how they, they potentially come. After that, we will we will go on to talk about the role of industry going forward within the EATS. What are the trends we see? Um, and Finally, we will come to the scenario analysis where we'll be taking the, the, the scenarios that Henning pr pr produced and, and we'll sort of translate them in, into, into inputs for our model and we'll see what happens with pricing and so on with the ETS. Okay, with, with that, I will dive right in. So um, industry uh, emission stands at about 44% of verified emissions within the ETS, as you can see here on this, this, this chart. Um, these are subsectors within industry, uh, predominantly consists of, of material producers like steel producers, cement producers, with oil and gas operations, and, and the chemical sector, of which uh, ammonia and, and plastics uh, present the, the lion's share. Uh, and I, I guess it, it's sort of a common denominator, a common challenge across the sectors is that they're all kind of classified as difficult to, to decarbonize. They, they have inherent um, uh, sort of emissions within the production technologies, or they, they require very high temperature heat for which electricity is not, not a very good, good substitute. So, so this, is, this is a sort of a, a challenge that we have on our hands, how we get these sectors to, to net zero, which we'll see in the next slides as well. So in the next slide here, we, we, we look at how, uh, over time, how it's this looked. And, and, and as we can see, power has had a consistent downwards trend in the last decade. The only exception being 2022, when the Ukraine war meant that some, some fuel switching was, was, was reversed. In total, it's, it's reduced its emissions by 29% compared with 2013. Uh, in, we can contrast this with, with industry, where it's only reduced its emissions by 11%, and, and much of this reduction comes in the last few years uh, on, on the back of, the, of a sluggish EU economy and, 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 and demand, demand reductions. Uh, so, so digging into this uh, a little bit further, it's also the case that, that many of the emissions cuts that we have seen from industry is driven by, by reduction in productions rather than energy efficiency or deployment of green technologies, which I sort of alluded to on the previous chart. Uh, and, and to see this, we have compare industrial output across these key four largest subsectors within the industry uh, and uh, so productions and, and, and emissions. Uh, for, for the ESO, ESO sort of indexed both to 100 in 2013. 
And, and to make this super clear, what we, what we would like to see if, if industry is, is really decarbonizing is that the blue line and, and uh, the sort of golden line uh, diverge. So that the blue line shoots up or stays the same and, and the uh, yellow uh, golden line goes, goes down. And in most of these sectors, that's not been the case. The only sector we so far have seen, seen this is, is so in, um, in cement. Um, so, so uh, as of yet, there's been little sort of fundamental decarbonization happen within the industry. I'll get to a little bit later. Things are are on the horizon, but but as yet, this, this is where we this is where we stand. So th this this picture, we we look at prices, and we as we were considering changes to the model for EU industrial output, we thought an an interesting question is whether EU prices to date seem to sort of co move with industrial production. And, and, and the answer here is that they're, they're at best weekly length, I think you can see, where barring some macro trends, which I've pointed out in this chart, we see the financial crisis of 08 and the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, where we can kind of see a, a sort of a sort of correlation between a drop in the amount and a drop in the EA price. The EA price has done, done its own thing, so to speak. Yeah. We, we, we think that the EA price has mostly been driven by supply side so changes so far. We have induction of SR, Tightening the cap with 50 or 55, sort of responsible for this, this, this rocket like takeoff in the last couple of years. And then lately, we have things like the repower EU volumes sort of dampening a little bit of that, that, that steep incline. Um, however, um, so, so going forward, we think this, this, this picture will, will change. Um, we, we, we think that the industry will, and I'll, I'll show this in the next three slides, we think that. EETS will become in increasingly industry focused, so that the majority of emissions will come from industry. Uh, and we also think that the EU will, uh, the industry will face much steeper incentives to decarbonize. We 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 see see that as a both as a uh, as a, uh, as a way of leveling the playing field, but also a way of giving a potential competitive edge to EU producers. And finally, we see a lot of corporate commitments to do something about. About, uh, about climate change. Uh, so going into this section, this is the first slide. And, and, and on the left, we see the sectoral shares of EU uh, emissions. And we see what we earlier showed today, we have 44% of emissions being from, from um, industry and a much larger share being from, from power. And we see how the industry share increases over time uh, due to the sort of more rapid decarbonization uh, in power. Uh, and we also see, if we look at the um, right-hand side chart, that free allocations. So just to get everyone on the same level, the e EU industry doesn't pay the full full cost of its EAs at the moment. They get a large chunk of their EAs for free. And we see this share, or we know <laughs> this share will, will decrease over time in, and quite drastically so towards the, uh, uh, the end of the decade. And this will give them a a more clear visibility of the carbon cost of their production and, and, and an incentive to do something about, uh, about this. So uh, uh, so what can we say about uh, CBAM? So we, we, as I learned to alluded to earlier, uh, we believe that CBAM could bring, could bring an additional edge to EU competitiveness in the domestic markets. So in tandem with the phase out of free allocations, uh, of course, we will introduce CBAM to prevent carbon leakage. And what we want to show, uh, and what we've done here is that for these selected CN codes, so it's great Portland cement and, and bars, rods, and steels, not one product in, in, in steel. We've taken estimates of average uh, emissions intensities within the EU and for our largest um, trading partners. Uh, and then we multiply these intensities with the forecast of EUA price in 2030 from, from Bates forecast. And we multiply this for with a C band phase in factor for foreign producers. For EU producers, what we done, we've done the same, but we used the free allocation phase out factor instead of the C band phase in factor. And that's, that's a lot, but our conclusion for this analysis and what we can see in this, yeah. these charts um, is that EU producers are at worst. Uh, slightly above average and at best top of class in terms of emission intensity, leading to um, a, 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 a sort of additional edge when CBAM comes online. 
uh, I should just say that this, this data this assumes that emissions intensities remain at the current levels um, until 2030, which of course they may not. Um, in the best case scenario, it produces reduced their emissions intensity given an even increasing um, uh, edge here. Okay, so at this in this slide we look at corporate commitments. So. What I mean by that is that we're looking at companies with really large exposure towards the UTS and their plans to decarbonize. Um, and even if we, I really painted a quite gloomy picture earlier of decarbonization within the EU industry, there, there's some momentum here, which we can see. And what we've done here is we've taken the top three companies within, within each of the four largest industry subsectors and looked at their climate emissions. Uh, and at first you can see on the, um, on the left of the chart, that actually the, the largest three um, uh, corporates within each of these segments represent a far, far better than the total, making this exercise quite useful. But then we look at the climate targets, uh, whether they have any, uh, and how ambitious it is. And, and what we can say is that all, all companies that we looked at have some form of climate targets. And, and most of them, as you can see in the final column on the, on the right, are aligned with that 1.5 degree world, at least in, in the long run. So summarize, industry wants to keep producing and it wants to do so with a lower footprint. That's our conclusion. What we're not showing on this page is we also looked at projects coming online and there's, there's this whole slew of potentially high projects, uh, potential high impact projects coming online with industries like green, green steel with hydrogen, CCS and cement, CCS and, and chemicals and the like. Right. So this, this, this brings us to, to the final, final bit, uh, the really interesting part where we will look at, at the scenarios and the scenario analysis. And we will first just give you a brief explanation of how we transform the scenarios. It's a, it's a bit of a boring uh, methodological housekeeping. Uh, and then we will look at the, the scenario results or prices and, and, and so on. Um, so, so we will develop these three scenarios to help us think about the potential consequences for, for demand destruction in, in industry. And what we've done is we've taken the scenarios that Henning talked about earlier and we transformed them from a sort of a Northwestern European natural gas scenario to an EU wide sort of emissions or demand uh, uh, scenario. And the trans transformation we see, see in chart here, and that's in, in terms of you know, demand destruction as, uh, as a percentage of 22. 2022 output. So, so in all cases, there are some some demand destruction, and we we'll focused on on output reduction, uh, output reduction uh, here. Uh, we've used a very very simple approach. We we just assume that 60% of all the reduction in natural gas comes from industry, and then that 10% of that is reduction due to output output reductions. Uh, we assume the to total 12% of gas the demand comes from from industry. Putting these things together. Gives, gives about these, these numbers. So, um, and, and I think a, a caveat in place before we dive into the, the real uh, nitty gritty of the result is that this, these are best seen as high level sensitivities rather than detailed predictions or very complete self consistent narratives. But we think that they're still very useful to think about uh, the dynamics of the EU ETS and how it can respond to industry demand, given that it's so uncertain what will happen with demand from industry. And what capabilities are for, for reacting uh, within the system to, to change the signal. So, uh, final, final slide here. How does the demand destruction scenario translate into changes of emissions and prices? And, and what I should say before, very quickly, is that what we've done is that we've taken this middle line, the base case, and aligned it to our base case, of course, mm -hmm. having two scenarios going, one going up and, and one going down. So on the left, we see how, how, how the emissions are impacted. Looking at 2030 and comparing with our base case, the golden line, we have an 11% increase for the high demand scenario and a 5% decrease for the low demand scenario. Uh, on the right, we can see how this affects prices. Again, looking at 2030, comparing with, the, with our, our golden base scenario, we said EU A prices increase of 25% for the high demand scenario and decrease 4% for the low demand scenario. So two initially interesting observations about this is that it shows a more than one for one increase in prices when industrial emissions are, are, are increased or decreased. Uh, just remember that 
the, the changes in emissions here are only industrial emissions and so not all of EU ETS emissions. So this is a big contrast with how unsensitive the EU prices seem to have been historically. So in our modeling, industry will have lots bigger impact on what will happen. And number two, it also shows an interesting asymmetry where it's the price changes more when we increase demand than when we decrease them. And that highlights some interesting asymmetries within the supply side of, of the EU ETS. So, so, so first of all, um, the sensitivity of the EA to change in demand depends on the increasing tightness of the market. We have a steeply declining cap, fewer allowances released every year. In addition to this, we think that the market balance every year will be negative, so we will start eating into our, our bank. That would just mean fewer allowances going around. And then, of course, the rapid decarbonization of power means that as we get closer to the end of the decade, there will be less flexible options for power to reduce their emissions. A large chunk of coal plants will already be phased out, leaving a little room for things like coal to gas switching. So that brings us to the very, very sensitive market. And, and, and for this, finally, for the nerds out there, we will talk about these asymmetries in, in the setup of the ETF. So first of all, it has to do with the, how the MSR, uh, the market stability reserve functions. So it acts more forcefully to tighten the supply when there's surplus in the market, as is the case in our low uh, demand scenario, uh, and a more, a more tepidly to loosen it when times when the market surplus in the case of our high demand scenario. So that's why we can see that prices can spring up a lot, but not come down quite quite as far. So two, two main reasons here. The maximum level of injection from the MSR is 100 megatons. Yeah, that's the maximum. Conversely, there, there, there's no upper limit for the intakes. That's a sort of more specified as a, as a percentage of, of, of the allowances out there, of TNAC. And um, as we can see, most years where we have intakes in, in the bottom right-hand side chart here, that they are above, well above 100 megatons. Uh, and then we also have something that they call the MSR buffer zone. So when CNAC is between 833 megatons and 400 megatons, uh, there will neither be intake nor injection from the MSR. So if there's a case where it's market tightening, you have to first go below 833 of, of allowances in, in, in circulations, then down to, to 400. And that transition, uh, in our analysis, and as you can see here, for the type of scenario, the dark blue one, high demand, it takes a year. So 2029, nothing happens, but it's just in 2030 where there's some extra injections into the, mod, uh, into the market. So there's less alleviation and it comes later, basically. Then we have, uh, the, digging even deeper, we have something called the cross-sectoral correction factor. So this is a mechanism by which EU ensures that Free allocations and auctions are always uh, close to pre-specified shares of the annual cap. This, this basically means that it's in, in the industry increases the share of overall emissions in, in the in the UATS. There will just be a certain number of of of, uh, uh, of of free allowances to go around. So if they if they keep at the high level or increase their emissions, uh, that that will actually not mean that they get more more more. More, more free allocations, but again, less of a share of free allocations that they would have otherwise. So we see this, this, this uh, correction factor being triggered in 29 and 30 in our forecast. So um, we just concluding this slide, we, we, we can say it's going to be tight approaching 2030. Um, there are mechanisms to tighten the market when it's loose, but not, not really the other way around. So if it becomes really tight, we're going to see really high prices. That, that is the, 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 the kind of gist of it. And, and stepping back and, and, and kind of summarizing this whole, this, at least my, my section on this talk, you know, what were our key takeaways? Okay, so number one, the significance of the industrial sector for the UTS market balance is certainly increasing. Number two, persistent high prices and tighter market conditions, as we've seen, mm -hmm. along with the reduced free allocations and the fact that it's been sluggish decarbonizations in industry today. This would raise the prospect of a, a solution, quote unquote, to the market balance where we have significant demand curve backs in yes hand. However, we have CBAM and other policies to reduce the appeal of such solution. And we also have uh, a, 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 a slew of, 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 kind of corporate commitments just to support that. And finally, it's the same point in saying that our, our models indicate that demand reductions have 
limited impact on price, but it might increase could have a significant impact if not met with um, uh, demand decrease in, in, in carbon. And and with that, I I, I just like to say uh, thank you and, and and hand back over to to Ingvild. Thank you, Henning and Harry, for your insights. Um, so now it's uh, time for some questions. Uh, and uh, one that has come is, uh, how do you see the German subsidies affecting industrial production in Germany? Uh, so I guess that's the first part of the question and thereby impacting the carbon price. Uh, so Henning, do you wanna have a go on the at least the first bit of, of it? Sure, yes, indeed, I'll be the first bit. Um, so uh, I, uh, one important aspect of also our scenarios and Harry already mentioned is, is there's, there is a huge degree of uncertainty to this, um, all of it, uh, how subsidies impact uh, industrial production, how the world economy fares. It's, uh, so it's, it's a scenario building um, exercise rather than a real forecast. However, within that, um, the, the, you can see slowly in, in the big industries in the EU, so Germany is the biggest example, but actually the Netherlands has been faster and probably better at this um, than Germany in implementing it, that they're, they're trying to um, uh, put together a package that addresses both the immediate ne uh, needs and emergency situation, stimulate growth, while decarbonizing. Um, and that is these different policy tools that are in place. So Germany is, is probably the best example. We we're talking about it a little bit. Uh, last Friday, the um, industrial electricity tax was reduced from 1.54 uh, cent per kilowatt hour to 0 0.05 cent per kilowatt hour, which is the EU legal minimum. That is an immediate tax benefit. So uh, once it's implemented, it'll it'll apply to anyone who's exposed to this industrial electricity cost reduction measure. Now, of course, you could say that that incentivizes more consumption, but actually, overall. This uh, uh, this tax break only uh, provides about a five percent reduction in industrial electricity price. So it's not a big measure. It sends an important signal, but it's not a huge measure. More important is the EU, uh, the, the German industrial supported 350 most energy intensive export industries, because that is support for their carbon costs, um, and that is a bit sneaky. Um, because, uh, you know, the German government still pretends to be super duper green. Uh, the Green Party is in the coalition. And so you could argue, well, but what's this? Um, now, they will argue that uh, this is a voluntary support package, that they you don't, as an industry, you don't have to apply for it, and you will only receive it uh, if you provide, in parallel, a credible plan to accelerate your decarbonization versus the status quo. That's how they're trying to balance that. Um, and then the last one is the huge contract difference for decarbonization. And I think that's the most important one, because that's a long-term measure that they've already co committed uh, 50 billion euros to this, um, uh, where we'll, you will get money to decarbonize your industrial system and to reduce your future reliance on um, fossil fuel imports. And when we talk to our uh, industrial customers uh, in that area, Germany is the biggest one, but again, the Netherlands, Belgium, they've all both uh, done similar measures. This is a key measure which will reduce gas consumption and fossil fuel. Uh, consumption because again you're getting money for for doing this and there's some interesting anecdotally and then I'll pass over to Harry um, to the uh, some interest in this you might have seen the headlines Abu Dhabi National Oil Corp Adnot is interested in buying Covestro which is this um, German chemical company and you might think why on earth would an oil and gas company buy a chemical company in the area that is most exposed to high energy costs in the chemical sector it is access to R and D and to these contracts for difference. That's that's probably what their interest is: buy low and get the the subsidies. And um, and this work, this I'm I'm absolutely certain this will uh, uh, lead to a strong incentive um, to reduce your gas consumption, even if you have these tax breaks and this current um, CO two cost support. Thank you. And um, Harry, do you have anything to do? You want to add to to that, or is You're on mute. Yep, that was a very comprehensive answer from from Henning, also with very deep insight to the policy. And I I think initially we 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 thought you know that there's going to be this, the the compensation for industry, which is largely based on their carbon cost, which will 
which is not which would put an uh, uh, um, which would increase crease production likely to some extent and, and might uh, put an upward price upward pressure on prices and you have the the, the support for electricity prices though it's though it's there's quite little and not that far into the future so it's hard because you could imagine that as many of the green green alternatives are based on, on, on electricity that that would provide an additional sort of incentives to switch but it's quite short in, into the future it's just two years and i mean if you're going to change production technology it's, it's going to be much much further further into the future so so i i, I don't see that that particular policy i mean uh, that much effect on the margin but probably something that yeah now to get some some relief yes Thanks. Uh, and um, just out of, uh, it's probably for Henning, yeah, just follow up from, from uh, uh, on this uh, uh, German energy relief uh, package that was proposed uh, on Friday, because uh, it's also, some of it is kind of uh, directed towards kind of the CO2 compensation uh, cost. And it's of course, not all countries across, uh, I mean, it's a voluntary to use the indirect cost compensation. Germany is one of the countries that are using this provision. Um, uh, and we, there are others uh, within the EU. Um, how important you see kind of the indirect cost compensation uh, going forward for uh, for industry in, in Europe? Will they kind of lump together where they will actually have in, indirect cost compensation or is that kind of a minor, minor detail? Henning? That's a good question. Um, I'm not entirely certain I can give a satisfactory answer to it. Um, the one thing that I think is uh, important, but both positively and negatively within the EU, uh, in, in the whole debate about how you support uh, the economy in this uh, cost crisis and how you decarbonize it, uh, we get a lot of questions saying, oh, the EU hasn't done this and hasn't done that. But uh, and if you compare it to the United States with its uh, Inflation Reduction Act, but the EU is much less a single, you know, it, it's the European Union, it's 27 member states. So actually what the member states do is hugely important. And Germany grabs a lot of the headlines because it's the biggest energy consumer, the biggest EU member, and uh, 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 and has the biggest cash coffers to support its industry and its households. Um, and they, they do it. They really do, whether they're social democrats or conservatives or liberal democrats or the Green Party, because they I mean in political terms their their survival uh, <laughs> relies on uh on people having jobs. And I've actually put into the chat earlier this is it's really important why these heavy industries are still being supported, even if they don't con contribute that much to GDP. They are all they produce they provide lots of jobs. They're unionized, so that they're sticky. Um, uh, so these cost measures will be supported. Their, their government uh, will continue to support its industry, even if it has to fudge green targets a little bit um, uh, in order to do so. And that brings me to a, an unfairness within the EU, because we think quite there's quite clear indications now that the EU members with the biggest fiscal means um, not overall, but you know, even you know, Denmark, Netherlands, um, they. Uh, they will have the, the the most efficient policies to come out of this crisis long term with effective industries, and that is uncomfortable and unfair because it leaves the rest behind a little bit. And so we think it'll actually deepen the, the wealth divide in Europe and cause future fission within the European Union. So I know it's not quite what you asked the question, but I, I think these national policies and the national ability of governments to act is going to be pretty crucial. And for some EU members, it will uh, mean uh, a fairly successful outcome and for others less successful, which is why in my slides I said, in this context, the North Sea Basin and the Iberian Peninsula look pretty strong, which by exclusion means that other areas look less strong. Uh, thank you. Do you use, let's see, uh, we have a question here. In the last couple of hours, agreement has been reached on the Net Zero Industry Act. Uh, there's a target of capturing 50 million tons of CO2 by 2030. What impact will this have on EUAs? Um, CCS hasn't been scaled up yet anywhere to capture this much. Uh, what if this never materialize? Um, uh, I think we can probably, yeah, it's a bit longer, but we can kind of, uh, if you, uh, Harry, do you have any views on on, on that? 
on well, CCS like, I guess, rules. I guess, I guess the, the problem is here is, is there hasn't been scaled up yet. And the important uh, caveat here is that neither has an, a removal solution either hasn't been scaled up that level yet if we count these um, high confidence, high quality carbon removals. And they're, they're not in the millions yet as what has been produced. Um, currently, I, I think that the estimate is that CCS is almost an order of magnitude cheaper than what direct active chapter is. So for, for industry, I, I, I can't really see that um, uh, direct air capture removals would, would be competitive with that, with just internally decarbonizing. Maybe at, at sort of a short term solution, but uh, given the prices are now somewhere around between 500 and 1,000 uh, euros, uh, that, that, that I don't think that's palatable uh, as, as an alternative to decarbonizing themselves. Um, and, and I mean, CCS is being scaled up at, at the moment. Uh, and shows every much uh, as much promise as, as does direct eye capture or, or any of the other technologies. I still think 50 million tons by 2030 sounds a bit over ambitious, but um, I, I, I sort of countering my own argument there is a little bit, um, you know, solar, electric vehicles, wind, they've all gone faster than anyone predicted. My own, my, my slight suspicion here or is a little bit the CCS um, is really difficult to find plug-in solutions because it basically means that every unit, whether it's an energy production unit or an energy consumption unit, they require tailored solutions, which makes it really difficult to scale as you can solar panels and wind turbines and electrolysis units for that matter. Um, but I do think CCS will be important. Uh, it'll just take a little bit longer, I think, from the direct air capture. I mean, I, I guess at some point we'll need it. Uh, we, as most climate scientists say, we need absolutely every solution we can get our fingers on to, to achieve our goals. But I think DAC is um, looks a little bit on the tail end of these things. Yeah, and I guess uh, that was uh, what Harry's uh, slide with the price scenarios also show that, uh, especially kind of towards 2030, and we haven't kind of touched upon what's happening after 2030 when the cap is going to to zero in 2040 um it's it's as you say henning that it's you can't leave out any any solution it's like all solution have to uh go the same way uh and all delayed action will have a consequence in terms of price uh i guess on some some uh some way or the other uh okay the time is uh three uh so we have spent a full hour on this interesting topic and uh, i would like to thank henning and harry for giving your insights and all of you uh participating uh and asking questions uh on the chat as well so thank you and have a nice uh, rest of the day thank you very much thank you